Well, now we're back in action. Uh, in, the, in this next half of the radar cross-section lecture, we're going to finish up the topic of uh, radar cross-section. Now, where we were in the uh, first half of the talk, we had started by um, doing some basics on radar cross-section and looking at uh, the different techniques for exactly measuring the radar cross-section of a full life-size target. And then we also looked at scaling down the target and scaling the wavelength as a method. And then we delved into the issue of how we calculate uh, from the, the exact knowledge of the target uh, what its cross-section is. And there are really, I'm show, well, I'm showing here there are five main um, methods that, he, that I'm going to go over. This by no means uh, is all of the, of the set of different calculational techniques. These are the five basic ones. The first two uh, give you the exact solutions, and these next four give approximate solutions that are good at very high frequencies. And each of these different methods have strengths and weaknesses and are used under different conditions. And in addition to these five methods, uh, since they were developed, there are a large number of uh, very sophisticated uh, techniques that have been added to this framework and which we'll allude to in a big table of different techniques that you can use to calculate cross-sections with the strengths and weaknesses um, that exist. And those really aren't the, uh, the, the in the domain of this course. And uh, the, y y so I'll just move on and uh, go over these one at a time, all five. In the end, you'll see uh, that you've got the basics here to understand how we cross-sect, how we calculate radar cross-sections. First, I went over the finite difference time domain method, which is an exact method of solving Maxwell's equations. And it does it um, using starting with the differential form of Maxwell's equations to calculate the exact fields and a uh, time step method using difference equation techniques. And we did that at the end of the last half that I went through. Next, we're going to look at the second method which where we which is an exact method and it solves the integral form of Maxwell's equations to get the exact currents and from the currents we'll get the scattered field and from the scattered field the radar cross section so let's start and go over that in the next though about 15 few graphs now here we have uh, an air breathing object in this case it's a cruise missile and at the highest level, uh, the, the physics of what's going on here is there's a plane wave incident on a target. And I'll just assume this target is a perfect conductor. And uh, when the plane wave hits the metal, uh, Maxwell's equations have to be uh, met. And in order, since you can't have like an elect electric field inside the perfect conductor, surface currents are induced and and uh, and those surface currents uh, give rise to a scattered field that, that's radiated by these induced surface currents so it's this is still going to be a two-step process first we, we determine the induced surface currents on the object and then secondly we calculate the the field radiated by those currents and then, of course, once we have the radiated field, we can just go, and the cross-section is in the limit uh, uh, of, of the distance between the radar and the target going to infinity of 4 pi r squared uh, times the magnitude of the scattered electric field squared divided by the uh, incident electric field squared. Okay, now here's the next shorter cookbook version without equations of how the method of moments works. 
the first thing we have to delve about is, is solve the integral form of Maxwell's equations. And the first thing we do is we generate a surface patch model of the target. And by that I mean uh, we make a model of the target which uh, consists of small pieces, each piece of which is a plane. And in this case, and in, in most cases, triangular patterns, triangular pieces are used. And we want the size of each triangle to be about an, uh, an eighth of a wavelength in order to give good accuracy. And then what we're going to do is once we have this surface patch model, we're going to use that to calculate uh, the currents. In each of those that are from pieces, those currents will give rise to, um, to uh, electric fields. And then from those electric fields, we can then go and get um, the cross-section. But we're, we're stuck with this integral equation form of Maxwell's equations. And what we're going to do is we're going to transform that the integral equation form of Maxwell's equations into a set of homogeneous linear equations. And the set will be of size n, where n is the number of patches. And the solution will give the surface currents on the target. And the scattered electric field can then be calculated in a straightforward manner from these currents. And knowledge of, as I said earlier, of the electric scattered electric field then allows one to readily calculate the cross section. There are limitations to this method. In, the, in, so, in solving this set of homogeneous linear equations, we're going to have to invert a matrix. If there are n pieces, there are going to be n simultaneous um, homogeneous linear equations to solve. And so that's going to be an M by N matrix, and that's not going to be easy, and, and as particularly at high frequencies. And the patch size, I said, is typically lambda rho over 10. Lambda rho over 8 will get you there. You're in a little trouble if you're down near lambda rho over 5. You're near the edge. But lambda rho over 10 is quite fine. But you can imagine if a, a target is relatively small, and the, you can make a relatively small number of pieces out of it that are readily those n pieces that was an n by n matrix that you could invert it with today's computer technology. Then you can use this method and get an exact solution. So we have to do this inversion of the matrix to solve the homogeneous linear equations. And this says these matrices are going to be pretty darn large. So first I want to just pr present to you so uh, the coordinate systems we're going to use. We're going to use the standard spherical coordinate system that will be set up somewhere in space. And we'll set this up uh, at the radar. And then we're going to have a surface. And that surface is the target. And that surface we'll call S prime. And coordinates on the surface are uh, primed coordinates where they'll be relative to a coordinate system up in the, say this was a, a, a sphere, we'd put the primed coordinate system in the center of the sphere, you know. And we're going to have a distance r, which is a vector r, between the point on the target that we're, we have, say, a little triangular patch, and the place we want to calculate the scattered field, and that distance, capital R, the vector, is equal to small r vector minus r prime vector. Okay? So the observation point is here, and the points on the surface are the primed points. And the currents are distributed over that surface S prime. Now Maxwell's equations were found uh, by a Stru uh, Stratton and Chu to, uh, to be able to be transformed into this form using vector Green's function. And this was done in the 40s. And it's written up in the book Electromagnetic Theory by Julius Stratton and Chu. 
and uh, it, it's the basis of all um, integral equation solutions of Maxwell's equations. And part of it, the psi, is a free space Green's function, which is this right here. And notice the r is the magnitude in this Green's function is the magnitude of r minus r prime. And the free space Green's function is a spherical wave falling off as 1 over r. And now note, in these equations, the E is the total electric field. And the E sub i, all with vectors, these are vector quantities, is the incident electric field from the plane wave. And E sub s is the scattered electric field. And the same thing with the magnetic field. Now, on the surface of a perfectly conducting target, these equations become uh, uh, to the, uh, they have a total tangential electric field is zero on the surface, and they have no magnetic sources of currents or charges as sources of scattered fields. And when you add in the fact that we have a perfectly conducting target, the electric field integral equation uh, becomes this, has this form. Okay. And this is the form of the magnetic field integral equation. Okay. Now since E is uh, both the incident and the scattered electric field, this is an integral equation. It's not that easy to solve. And we've added in here this uh, a, a d different form. And likewise, this is the magnetic field integral equation. And these are the first is the, uh, the EFIE and the MFIE forms of the scattered fields. And the causes of the scattered fields are electric currents and charges, uh, from the scattered electric field and electric currents from the scattered magnetic field. Now, if we take those equations and we apply the boundary conditions of Maxwell's equations and the continuity equation to, uh, to, to free space equations, and remember the continuity equation just says charge is conserved. The continuity equation states that the divergence of the current plus d rho dt is equal to zero. We add that into these equations. We see that we have some nice current densities in here that we want to solve for. And the, this is the form of, of this encompasses the boundary condition saying that the, the cross product of the total electric field is zero and, and similarly here. So this procedure can be used to calculate the, the scattered electric field, convert the integra integral equations here to a set of algebraic equations, and likewise go through solve the induced current densities using matrix algebra. And when you know the currents, uh, ca calculating the uh, scattered field is quite easy. Uh, you'll see in the next view graph or two, sometimes the, uh, the scattered field they have up on top and some on bottom. Please excuse me for that error. Okay, so the first thing we do, as I said earlier, is we want to break up into a set of discrete patches. And we want to expand the surface charge density into a known set of basis functions. And basically, the set of basis functions are the current uh, inside, the current inside each triangular piece right here. And they each have weights. And we defined, uh, to make the equations look easier for you to see, we define this magnetic field operator, L sub h, of the current density as this material, this set right here, which was on the previous uh, magnetic field integral equation, and insert the series expansion of the currents, bringing out the sum of the operator. In other words, what you do is you have for each of the pieces here, you have a 
one of these equations and you expand the series bringing out the sum of the operator and we get that LH of J is this sum. Okay. Now multiplying by a weight vector and integrating over the surface this is what we get, this long expression. And there are two different methods, a point testing method and, a, and Galkerin's method. Um, uh, the Galkerin method is used almost all the time and it gives to a much more accurate, better solution. Uh, I'm by no means an, an expert in uh, computational electromagnetics, but uh, I, uh, I, I asked my son, Andy, who's a grad student in computational ENF, why the Galkerin method is used. And he says it's just more accurate. And uh, in any case, when you do that and you take out the, 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 the I sub n's out of all this stuff that's switching the integrals and the sums around, what we get is a set of n equations in n unknowns where the current coefficients are I sub n. And in a big generalized sense, what we have is this quantity right here, which we'll call the vector v. And the i's come outside, excuse me, and then we have n equations. And then all this stuff is in the matrix. So we have a set of equations where we have a matrix Z times the current coefficients, and that's equal to a quantity V. And of course, if we just multiply um, the inverse of this matrix Z to both sides of this equation, we get the currents by just uh, multiplying the inverse of that matrix times the vector V. And the only difficulty is inverting this very large matrix V. Now, let's take that back to uh, the monostatic uh, RCS of a square plate, which we looked at earlier. And here we see uh, the, the peak where the, uh, the, the, br br the broadside peak where, the, where theta is 0 where the beam comes in and bounces off. But if you take a, uh, an electromagnetic wave coming in at an angle, that's that angle theta, and we get roughly this shape right here for measurement. Now then if we use the method of moments with a patch size of lambda over 4 and n equals 12, this right here would be the patch, the different little uh, pieces of the of the patch model, you get pretty good accuracy and you get it pretty good out to the side lobes. Now that's the good news. The bad news is it's safe for instance we go to the JGM model and we look at calculating uh, using the method of moments to calculate the cross section of that and we go to a, a fairly high frequency, excuse me, a fairly low frequency of a 1 gigahertz, and we get end up with 1,350 unknowns. And that is one big matrix to invert. And you can imagine, this is just a simple cone, a simple cylinder, and a simple flat uh, wings as, as uh, not wedges, but just plates for, for these different uh, uh, elements. Uh, it, it, it's a very simple object, relatively speaking, but it's got 1,350 unknowns. If we took a fighter aircraft, uh, you know, like a, an F-14 or an F-16, you can imagine the number of patch, patches you'd have, and just one heck of an in, of a matrix to invert. Remember, we're doing this in three dimensions. So in summary, the method of moments, solutions, is exact. The patch size must be small enough uh, so that, we're, that we meet that lambda over 8 criteria. 
approximately, and it's well suited for small targets at long wavelengths like an artillery shell at Albion. Uh, aircraft size targets give huge matrices. I told you about the JGM, which is 5 meters in length. And at L band, we have 1,350 unknowns. Fighter aircraft, which is, say, oh, excuse me, this should be 15 meters in length. Uh, it's a very difficult computation. It's a S band or X band. Now we uh, go in to compare uh, the two different methods, method of moments and uh, finite differences. And I'm sorry for you people who are looking at black and white PDFs, but the two-dimensional calculations are here, three-dimensional calculations are here, and, and they involve the different number of unknowns. So we have, uh, you know, we're dealing with, at worst, um, comput the worst thing you first look about is computational time, and you're up to for 3D, uh, 3D object calculations, the computer time goes up as the fourth power of the uh, of the number of patches you have in the method of moments. And in this, in terms of time steps, it's the third power. And it goes up in terms of memory requirements as the sixth power of the uh, number of unknowns. Both are exact. But they, again, they're exact, but they have limitations. Okay, now we're going to take a quick break, and, we're, and then we're going to go back and do geometrical optics, physical optics, and then the geometrical theory of diffraction and the physical theory of diffraction, which are all approximate methods which are used at high frequency.